at UFRJ. Uh, this, the public databases are fundamental for their effective advance in the understanding of brain function and treatment of this dysfunction. In neuroscience, the provision of public data is a global trend and building database that we allowed the recovery of the clinical neurophysiological information in a systematic way is a challenge in contemporary science. This challenge lies in the interface between computer science, neurobiology, statistics, and medicine. Uh, this this work uh, create, was create a digital database of a public access uh, for with the contest of the Research, Innovation, and Dissemination Center for Neuromathematics. Uh, in 2014, uh, began the creation of a database that stores uh, the standard and security manner uh, the data set collected, collected in the Neuroscience and Rehabilitation Lab. Uh, in INDC UFRJ. The first uh, proto prototype is the database from patients with brachial plexor injury. We talked all about this yesterday a little bit. This is the brachial plexus. Uh, this injury uh, primarily occurs uh, by automob uh, automobile accidents in young people affecting sensory and motor nerves to upper limb. The main treatment is uh, intensive physical therapy and in some cases, uh, surgical renovation to the brachial plexus. BPI is an important model to the investigate mechanisms of brain plasticity, plasticity following the peripheral nerves injury. Uh, here is some example. Uh, the most uh, common uh, injury is by stretching these nerves or compression. Uh, in in our hospital, we we do a multidisciplinary team to create this database uh, with doctors, physiotherapists, and neuroscience, and some neuromatic research here from USP. Uh, the creation was uh, separate for four steps. The first step was uh, general information to the patients like this. This is our interface. Uh, the first name, address, number of the registration, social demographic data like uh, ethnic group, religion, profession, social history, and we can upload some exams like x-ray, like uh, electroneuromyography to, uh, to the, the program. The second steps was create some specific assessment, medical, uh, physical therapy, a specific exam of force, surgery description in some scales specific from functional of the upper limb. We use to create this assessment uh, Lyme survey. The Lyme survey is a free software developed to order to prepare, publish, and collect survey response. Uh, once you have created a questionnaire, it can be published online in a lot of ways. We here we 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 recreate some specific. Uh, evaluations from diagnosis uh, neuropathic pain, for example, uh, physical therapy, surgery, um, some scales from functional uh, movement to the, to the arm. Now is the first, is the, the first uh, assessment paper and we change with Lyme survey, with help to Lyme survey, and we can put everything in the in the computer and, and create these questionnaires. Like here, uh, physical exam, we can uh, assess uh, scoliotic posture, uh, scars, some uh, traffic uh, uh, dysfunction to the to the upper limb. 
And before the, the, the program, the Lyme survey is, uh, we can, um, sorry, we can, no time, yes, uh, take off the specific information like uh, for us, how many patients uh, come to the to our to our service with zero of, uh, elbow flexion, for example, and side of lesion. How many patients is start with us? And a lot of a lot of patients have something fractured with uh, associated to the accident. Now the. Evandro will continue to the four steps, next steps to the NES. Well, well uh, <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Evandro. I, I work uh, I work in, in a, Neuromatch. Uh, I work in. Oh, <laughs> it's difficult. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm working with within uh, a development with a, uh, a development of a software uh, that that uh, uh, that is named uh, NES. Uh, N E S. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, great, thank you. And maybe and uh, neuroscience experiment systems. Uh, the main goals uh, of NAS is to manage, control, and 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 store neuroscience experiments. And and. and that experiments is uh, and this is experiment data collected in, in the labs or in the hospitals on or any uh, research in, institutions well some slides ago uh, we we saw we saw some print screens from from the software from us and well, well, and and right, and, and and this this well, Juliana show showed the steps one and, f and two, uh, that is related to the first version of NAS, and. At this time, we, we are developing this, the second version of NES, and that is uh, that the main goal of this, the main feature of this this version, is experimental protocol. is is a kind of of uh, we we are trying to represent in as a workflow uh, all the steps uh, that that that. A, uh, experiment is is performed, and in this way we, we can represent stimulus, tasks, instructions, and some pauses or questionnaires. Uh, all the steps uh, we we are trying to represent all the steps that uh, that a, a experiment can be performed. And well, then this is the this is the main main feature of of this version. Uh, in this this version, we are we are try we are as as we installed the first version in in the uh, We we had we did some adjustments in. In the software, in order to uh, based on the feedback of the the users. Well, uh, the next steps of of the software 
uh, we are talking about uh, the, the future. Uh, the next step is is load and manage physiological data. Uh, that means we are we are, we have uh, we want to collect to import to the software uh, all the data about EEG, uh, for example, EEG, EMG, TMS, or stabilometry. And and in this case, we have we have some some challenges. Uh, uh, some some to, to lower and manage this kind of, of information. Uh, uh, well, this information is, uh, is a is a specific kind of information. Uh, in general, uh, some exam uh, has has a, a big volume. Of information, and and a challenge is, is to how to store this, the data efficiently in order to 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 lower uh, this this large information, and how to find quickly. Uh, uh, another another challenge is. Uh, Research projects use different ways to 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 store data. Then uh, this is the why we we have to standardize uh, all the information that we can we we want to import to the system. Then and when we when we we standardize <coughs> the information, we. We can we can reuse reuse them and share uh, in a in a easy way. Is a easy way to share and reuse information. Oh, another step and that we we want to to do is data sharing. Uh, the the main idea in, in in this in this uh, the main idea of of this picture is to show how how we, we want to we want to to provide uh, this kind of sharing of information. Then uh, in the lab in the lab local infrastructure in structure. Uh, we want to 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 develop some some local tools like NAS. NAS is a is a software that will be located uh, will be installed in the lab. And this this software will collect all all kinds of 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 experiments. Uh, in order to to construct a, a, a public database, we have to construct uh, before uh, some integration tools. These integration tools will, is, uh, will be responsible to import, to to extract, collect, and load, and, and sometimes transform the information from the lab to the central database named here Neuromath database. This is the uh, this integration tools w w will be uh, will be the main the main the main point to uh, anon anonymization uh, anonymization process of of this information. Because uh, inside the, the lab, inside the lab, we have the information about the, the patient, for example. The Linux for, for example, for, for example, or any lab. Yeah. Then 
uh, inside the lab or uh, any laboratory, uh, we have the information about the patient and so on. But when this this tool imparts the information, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then this tool is will be responsible to anonymization to the anonymization process. Then here, uh, that patient that was re registered here uh, will be will be just a number in this database. Uh, Besides the database, we have to construct it to develop uh, a web portal that that will be the, the interface between the users, the external or is, uh, internal users, and the database. And this tool is will be responsible to to do uh, some kinds of searches, advanced searches, and and, and 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 also compare uh, two or more ex uh, experiments or or kind of experiments. Um, well, that's it. I, I will I will pass the the microphone to this Juliana again. Thank you. <laughs> Just to finish. Uh, the numbers we have, we have uh, 53 patients uh, in the in the program now. We have uh, 69 to be uh, cadastrated in the in the program. Now we have set questionnaires, uh, clinical and some for experiments. To all of all of these patients will be uh, made it is uh, submitted to these questionnaires all of in the program, and we are the development, pain assessment, most strange from dynamometry, poster, and psychological assessment. The, just a sample, a little sample, uh, what we have that uh, corroborates the papers. We have uh, the most patients with motorcycle accident, uh, and the most uh, have total lesion to the brachial plexus, the three trunks are injury. Uh, now the, the, the difficult to us is uh, find all of the information, old information and old patients to put in the, in the new program to the, the new the new way uh, with NAS and we have a lot of information very different uh, incomplete information and information very different from clinical uh, past uh, surgical past from two years ago five years ago and we have uh, adequated this information to put in the, the new program and now is the more more uh, we will spend a lot of energy, a lot of time to do this, but it's, uh, before, uh, sorry, uh, after we do this, uh, the catch to the data from the patients and the experiments will be more easy and, uh, and better. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's it. Thank you, sorry for the English. <laughs> Okay. We are trying to finish the second version. Ah, no, you are in the second. Yeah. Okay. We are in the second. But uh, we are trying to, to finish this, the second version uh, this, this month. This month. This month. <laughs> 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 Kelly's. <laughs> and and, and after that, we, we, we want to start this, the, the third one. The third set, and, and start to collect, uh, start to develop, 
uh, to study uh, all kinds of, of experiments. In the next uh, month, we, we were we we have a uh, uh, one more one more member in the the team. <laughs> Sweely, <It's> <laughs> <laughs> and and we we, we 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 hope to to attend you as soon as possible. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Karina, and I will talk about a little bit about my postdoc uh, working products. Uh, my advisor is Antonio Hawk, and uh, is uh, joint work with uh, research from the University of Utrecht, Marcel Martin Rovet. So, uh, in the first years of the Neuromat project, we Propose a lot of uh, a few models of stoch uh, stochastic models for neural uh, bio biological neural networks. So, uh, in the goal, the main goal of my, my work is to find ways uh, to find ways to show that these stochastic models has the has the ability to play a similar behavior that we found in collected data. We found the collect date, okay? So here we're gonna use to do this uh, function connectivity. You compare function connectivity with uh, neural, neural, neural connectivity of this stochastic uh, models for the neural, uh, for the biological neural nets, okay? So what's function connectivity to us? We we'll consider here as the temporal coherence between a, a neural brain si a signals of anatomic segregate brain regions. That in ca and can be measured by calculating the co correlation between resident states, both fMRI uh, time series. And this data was provided for us by the uh, by the University Medical Center, um, for uh, collected by uh, Mar uh, Martin and others, and Marcel too, and uh, they divided the brain in six, 68 regions, different regions, and calculate the cor correlation between these regions using the fMRI time series. Those, uh, why are we doing this kind of comparison? Comparison, right? Yeah. Comparison, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, recent observations shows that uh, it exists a high correlation between the current fluctuation in neural spikes. No, sorry. Let's start it again. So, uh, recent observations show suggests a direct link between resting states both fMRI, okay, and uh, increased in neural activity. So that's why we are doing this comparison between functional connectivity and uh, neural neuronal activity. Increased neuronal activity. Interested, uh, the, the spike trains that happen between regions, so the, the, the neural activity in the in the in each region brain. Yes, mercy states. So to do this, we first we consider the Galvez and Lochaba model. So they consider a uh, stochastic chain, thank you value in this space. On the E is the set of neurons. And for, and the process considered that 
x t i is equal one if you know i has a spike at type t in zero device so it's like a spike trains uh, okay so we can find the less spike times of the new like this like this and we, in, we let's define the fa family of synaptic ways between the neurons, where this quantity is a real value. If it is different to zero, then uh, J is affect I, and if it equals to zero, it's not a connection between these two neurons, so J doesn't, doesn't affect I, okay? And we say that uh, the neuron does affect it, uh, himself, okay? So the, the dynamics of the, the process can be represented by these probabilities. So at each time t, the probability of, of a spike in, in neuron i at time t, the, uh, the condition on the whole path is a function that depends on the accumulative visual of the, process, uh, the system. Um, in, this, in this interval, that means that um, the neuron has to look at, uh, to the whole pa uh, to the path until he finds his last time, his spike time. Okay. And uh, an aging factor that is the distance between t and the time of the, his last his last spike time. Okay. So that's so. So here's the factor that if J does in fact hide this, it, this, they don't enter in this, this calculation. So that's fine. So can I continue? Uh, so we look at this model, we have a, a neuron scale model. So we, we look into neurons, to a network of neurons and Unfortunately, we don't know this. We don't know the connection between the neurons. We, but we have a microscope scale, uh, a microscope brain uh, network. What is this? Uh, is in the uh, region brain uh, scale. So we have 60, we, again, they divide the brain in 60 different regions and uh, calculate the strength of co anatomic, né? they calculate the white matter pathway between this, each region of the brain, and they, get a, they obtain a 68 by 68 matrix, that I, I call it A, which the information about the strength of connections between regions. So what I have is, um, So what I have is a matrix A, such that A, J is equal to zero. If a region J, I, and J is not connect, and A, J is different than zero, where A, J, A, I, J belongs to zero one, if it is a connection between these two regions. And this is a strength of connection. Okay. Uh, how, how, how do you estimate this strength? Uh, this is, yeah, it's an atomic connection. They calculate how many pathway of white matter pathway there is, and they calculate the average between this, and they create this matrix A. This is anatomic. Yes, this is, this is, it's, yeah. This is saying that there is connections between these two, the, these two, these two regions. So it's the number between zero and one, okay? This is important because we're gonna use this matrix A to expand the, this, this, so this matrix. So we, here we are talking about brain regions, so, but we want uh, in a neural scale, we want a connection between neurons. So how are you going to do this? Is using this matrix expand the the network. So here's the second step. 
So to connect, so what we do, we take the, each region and put any n neurons in which in each regions, and connect its n neurons uh, as follows. So I take two pairs of neurons in the same regions and connect them with probability d. So I choose a d, a parameter d, and say ah, uh, in, uh, using the Randall-Henny Randall graph, Erdogan Randall graph, to to connect the to to create to generate the the, uh, uh, the connectivity between neurons in in one regions. So we do this for the 68 regions. So now we can okay, now we have to connect the neurons of different regions. So we use so we take uh, two neurons of different regions and connect this and use the probabilities given by matrix A to connect this to choose if you we're going to connect these two neurons or not. Okay. So this is how we expand the, the graph to a neuron scale. Oh, and it's like a parameter. So you choose a uh, let's start to with n equal, equals 100. Or, so it has to be chosen by us. So which we think is bad. Yes, you can change it. Yes. But uh, you, you can have a connection between any two neurons, one in this region and what in this region. Yeah, yes, I can, but uh, if only if this is different to zero, okay? And with the, with the probability that we're given by the matrix A. Yes, because all neurons are educated, so uh, they are distinguishable. Just arbitrary too. So I use first I use 2D, 0 0.5 and 0 0.3. Like, um, but we discussed with uh, Wahi that maybe 0 0.5 is too large. My question is locally, it's supercritical, supercritical. Uh, it's model. We have to think about this. So now we have this spike trains for all the neurons in the in the in the system. So how are we going to compare this with this function matrix fun, function connectivity matrix that we have? Um, so we do uh, an averaging uh, time varying mean neural activity of each re region brain. So we take uh, the any uh, neurons that is in the region. And we we take the mean of the 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 spike activity, and we smooth this 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 function uh, this time series, and we calculate the correlations between the the regions uh, using this this uh, how can I call it uh, mean neural activity okay time series of mean neural activity okay so. Then we compare with the uh, matrix of, uh, of the both fMRI data. So here's the problem. Um, okay, um, how we, we? Okay, so we are comparing then through the correlation between these two matrices. Uh, maybe it's not the best way to compare this. This we have to. I think think about it a little more or, and trying to use other types of measures to, to 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 see how how can this the similarity between these two matrix. Okay? Uh, but using the correlation between these two matrix, uh, if I calculate 
for the new mode, if you, if you I'll calculate for the matrix, uh, the correlation between matrix y and the function connect the, the matrix of function connectivity, I have this correlation. So in, uh, they say that the, the people of uh, neuroscience says if you, if you, if you, your model can uh, exceed this value, we are having good good results. No models is the matrix is like we do nothing. The no models is uh, the correlation that and we do nothing. So we calculate. It's like a, if you I don't do now. Uh, you don't have time to use this is a normal model for them. So we had to be this number, and uh, I use some model the as simplest models like this to generate the sample. And uh, unfortunately, I. Just, I can exceed this number, but this is a very simple model. So uh, this do doesn't depend. It's a context equals one. So I can change this, um, the this factor. I don't. I I I'm not consider the aging factor in this function. This, so it has a lot to change to maybe be try to be the number that is not what we're getting now. Oh, K is the density of the graph. Yes, what is the density of the graph? The mean of, uh, so the mean connections between, uh, the mean, the mean of connections of the graph. So, is, I, yes, is. Yeah, average degree, yeah. By N and P and P. Yeah. So is that what I want to talk about. Thank you. Yes, I have a question. Uh, I, I remember Roberto told me that you consider that the results you got were better than the one. So could you explain why? The problems that which we are we we calculate the correlation of the whole matrix. We don't we are considering things like the diagonal that is all ones. So this increases the correlation between. So if you take off this this information, you, we start getting bad results. The, so we were calculating the correlation between the whole matrix. So. Then no, we are considered the diagonal for for the two. What is the correlation of the whole matrix? I don't understand. The, what do you mean by the correlation of the matrix? And we calculate the correlation between one, the two matrix. The two so for the time evolution. No. So how do you use the time evolution? No, you the time evolution to calculate the, the correlation matrix of the each brain regions. So we have the six A brain regions. We calculate the use the mean neural activity to calculate the correlation between these regions. So that's what we use the time, time evolution. evolution. So now we have a matrix of the correlation between regions using to calculate this matrix we use the neural activity generated by the model. Okay? So and we have the functional connectivity that was calculated through the resting tape rest state both a from a right time series so the data, so, data. so the, the biological data for the experimental data he did so we uh, now we have to compare these two matrix proof of correlation uh, maybe so correlations yeah yeah similar so mm -hmm. maybe correlation is not, is not the best way to do this Maybe we have to think about another way to. Yeah. The universal answers. Why don't you consider a statistical model selection? So how can? What I believe. What I believe you can do is compare those two objects, trying to find um, 
linear model or general linear model that you can compare to to objects that are different. Even if you have like a matrix and you have an object that it's a vector or a matrix, you can find ways of connecting those two objects through the linear model or the general linear model. There are there are some people doing things that are but you can model the time evolution through a coefficient that changes. Yeah. I think well, it, in the end we compare with mat uh, correlation matrix. We don't have uh, any more the time evolution. I think. But from what I understand, if they have two matrices, yeah. right, that you want to compare and to find what is the best way of identifying the connection between those two matrices, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe the best, but the best strategy is not to. Yeah to compare them like point by point, how, how is the best? I think the question is, how is the best way of comparing two matrices? Yeah. yeah. And I, I know that there are people doing regression models for those type of objects. So we know the linear model, as we know, we have two vectors or a vector and a matrix, and we want to compare them and find coefficients that relate those two objects. But there are ways that you can find a model that relates those two objects that are matrix and matrix or even multidimensional objects. Uh, I know that some people are doing work in that direction. Maybe it's a good strategy. Yeah. I don't know. It's just a suggestion. I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, go ahead. No, no, I don't have a question. No, I would say that, I mean, we should say skip this discussion and discuss tomorrow because of, on behalf of time, but I mean, I do really want to Oh, I, I, um, I just want to uh, stimulate people from the audience to ask questions and yeah. de debate the results. Me, so people, the, not me and Michelle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> other people. Everybody is very welcome to ask questions. Oh, okay. Uh, so, in, in in how do you which? What is the parameter that it represents the activity of a of a burn region for you? You're using frequency of spikes. What is what you're using to represent the activity? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I mean, if for to do the functional connectivity, you yeah. need to correlate two activities between regions. What is the parameter that it means that one region is is more active than than other? More act, yeah, I think it, we don't consider the difference. We don't see if we, one region has more spike than the other. So from this kind of model, uh, one region will, will have more uh, activity if a lot of neurons are interact with, the, with them outside the, this region. So the number of spikes. So this is this is affects the, the increase the activity of the if this is a if this a i j is large, it's close to one, so it has a lot of connections in the in this region it will be more activated. Okay? Okay. The last question a very short one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Martin van who is a Martin van der Röwe, who is a co-author, uh, he, he gave a, a striking evidence that the region's uh, interactions describe a special type of random graph they call the rich club. Yeah. So if you do the way you do, with you locally with... Uh, around um, Eldor Schenny model and then connect your regions, does this give you a rich club graph? Oh, I don't know. I have to check. Maybe. Because, because yeah, I have to check. I and I'm going to see. So. I know. Hello, 
good morning. So my name is Larissa, my advisor is Kelly, and I will present my master project. So I'm, I will be creating a family of database schemas for neuroscience experiments. Uh, this is my agenda. Uh, first of all, let's uh, talk about the importance of neuroscience experiments. Uh, neuroscience experiments uh, study the correlation between cerebral systems and the normal or modified mental activity. Uh, in this kind of experiment, it's important to store the provenance data. What are these provenance data? This is the data related to the experimental protocol used in the data collection and the other orthogonal information, like uh, when data was collected, where, like the laboratory, where it was collected, by who, and this kind of information. Uh, such metadata uh, are essential for making judgments about data quality, integrity, and authenticity. Uh, when scientists want to share the experiments, it's important to uh, have this provenance data. Then uh, they can analyze and reuse the experiment's results. Oops. So what type of data do you have? We have the protocol uh, experimental data. So we have like a lot of components in the protocol. Then you have the data collection that you have a lot of types of data collection and like the subject types. Uh, for example, you have human and no human. Uh, what's the problem here? We have uh, so many data that is very variable. So it's difficult to start uh, in the problem. Uh, it's difficult to start this data digitally because of the variability of this data. So here the challenge. What do we borrow, borrow? Different types of yes, yes. For example, here we have different types of components, then different types of data collection. And for example, in each data collection, we have specific parameters that we need to store. So it's very variable. Uh, so the challenge is this data variability that is difficult to store in a uh, common or traditional database model, then the lack of patterns in scientific community, and uh, the evolution of this extru structure is difficult to, uh, to have a, a, a fixed model of database. So what's the, the idea here? Is to create a family of conceptual database schemas for neuroscience experiments. Uh, uh, we will create a notation that enables neuroscientists to easily extend this family. Uh, for example, they can extend this uh, model to adapt and represent new experiment types. And we will develop a software to automate this creation of database schemas. So the contributions here is to create customized conceptual database schemas, consider the specific needs of each laboratory, uh, create patterns to represent neuroscience experimental data, and enable the scientific community to share, use, and reproduce data related to experiments. Uh, so I'm going to introduce some uh, concepts that I'm going to use. First of all, it's uh, the concept of uh, conceptual schema. So basically, we have entity types, attributes, and relationship types. Uh, for example, here, researcher and uh, institution are entity types. This is the relationship between researcher and institution, works at, and uh, these are the attributes of researcher and institution. Uh, the other method that I'm going to use is software project, product line engineering. So the definition is, uh, it's a paradigm to promote the reuse of software uh, artifacts by managing the common and variable functionalities of the, the specific domain. We have those, uh, two phases. In the first one, 
we will uh, define what are the common and variable f functionalities and create a repository of reusable artifacts. And in the second phase, the application engineer, we will use this uh, repository to create uh, customized products of software. So in this uh, paradigm, it's common to uh, use the feature diagram, that is this diagram here, to uh, capture the commonalities and variabilities between software applications. I'm going to explain a little bit this model. Uh, so uh, the mobile phone here is the root of this diagram. Then we have uh, all of uh, these uh, rectangles are uh, features that you can have in a project of software. So for example here, in mobile phone, we always have calls. It's a, so it's a, a mandatory feature here because of this, this SQL. Uh, and we can have uh, GPS, for example. Then we have a screen also, and we can have media, it's optional. Then if we have, uh, we have a screen, then you can choose of basic screen, color screen, and high resolution screen. I can choose one and only one of these three options. And here in media, if you have media, you, you can have a camera and MP3, you can have both of them. Then, uh, so we have this mandatory, optional, alternative, and your uh, relations. And then you have the requires and excludes relations. The requires, for example, uh, is when you have a camera, then you, you need to have a high resolution of a screen. And when you have a GPS, we can't have a basic screen. So one excludes other. So uh, in my project, I wanted to uh, I want to adapt this diagram, this feature diagram, for the database context. So I am going to create these database feature diagrams to express the data variability in database schemas. In my diagram, a model is a partition of a conceptual schema, and a model will be the same of feature. Then I will have the same relations of the, this diagram, so these relations here. And I will have these annotations that will say uh, which modifications I'm going to do in my database model uh, when I select this, uh, these two modules. So I'm going to explain here. Uh, for example, this is for the Neuromat project. For example, I have this database, and uh, it's uh, mandatory to have experiment, mandatory to have a group, of subjects here. Uh, then, uh, for example, when I have, uh, I will explain here. When I have a subject, I, ha I can have you no know, human subject and human subject. For example, this relation number two here. When I have a subject and I have a human, then I need to create this uh, specialization in database schema. So I need to add in a specialization College subject type between subject entity and human entity. So I'm going to modify my data database schema, database conceptual schema, using this diagram. And here, for example, when I have a group, I will have experimental protocol. Then I, I, I need to do this R8 here. So it's add a relationship has experimental protocol between group entity and component configuration, and now I say the cardinality, that's one to one. So how I'm gonna validate this, this model? Uh, I, I want to validate this with a group of researchers of different laboratories associated to Neuromat, and uh, the quality of my, my proposal will be evaluated by means of uh, controlled experiments and uh, case studies in the context of Neuromat project. Uh, what I'm going to evaluate is support to variability, flexibility, maintainability, and evolvability of database models to create this family of uh, database schemas. So uh, just to resume my project here. 
The ob objective is propose solutions to represent and store data of neuroscience experiments. The challenge, uh, deal, deal with this variability of experimental data and be user-friendly for neuroscience is the most important thing. The approach is uh, to adapt the software project line paradigm to use uh, represent variability in terms of database. And the expected result is become a reference for representing neuroscience experimental data. Thank you, questions? I'm, I'm very impressed by the work of the software team in Neuromat. I guess Neuromat has two periods, um, BK and AK, AK, before Kelly and after Kelly. Kelly is, uh, Kelly is the leader of the project. And it, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed. And when we think about uh, the situation, for instance, we received the visit of Pedro Valdez Sosa, which is a big new scientist. And there has lots of very interesting um, data from 40,000 children in Panama. And this data is in, 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 written in paper, so probably it will be lost in a few years because nobody will remember. So one thing we think we should do is to, uh, to export uh, NES and all, all this technology the team is developing for instance, for, for the Cuban Center of Neurology, because they have very rich data. And I remember that in the beginning of the project, Claudia spent several days explaining to Stoffi how was organized the data from EEG they got. Several days, several days, and yet he didn't understand. And uh, now with things like this, the tools like this, all this will be done in an automatic way. So I'm very, very impressed. I think uh, the contribution of the software team to Neuromat is the most important point in these first two years. I, I would say maybe, maybe even if it's the most important thing we have done in these two years. So I comment. And thank you to um, all the team uh, and to the newcomers. kind of question from someone who is outside of the field. Uh, how does this project relate to other database projects worldwide, in a worldwide basis? I know that, for example, the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility is uh, promoting the development of databases which are also open and accessible to other researchers in the field. How do you relate your work to the efforts? I don't know if I understand the question, but uh, like in database era, I want to contribute to, like, uh, to construct these database schemas that are variable. And like uh, database schemas in use, we can adapt to store new data every moment. So this is the contribution in database uh, area. Is it the question? Or Kelly wants to comment on that? Yeah, I just wanted to know how you compare your your, your your database, your framework, to other frameworks ah, okay, okay. which are being developed in the world. In fact, today we have a lot of open databases in the neuroscience area, and uh, the, the most part of them works as, uh, as a federation of data sets. They don't have a common structure. They, they work like a repository of data uh, provenient of different projects with uh, um, different quality of data, and we, uh, it's difficult to query this data, to compare the experiments, and, um, and even the, the access to data is over complicated. I, I will talk a, a little bit more about this tomorrow in my presentation, but um, the main problem maybe is the absence of uh, the lack of standards to represent data in neuroscience. So uh, wh what we're trying to do is uh, to organize the data a little bit more than uh, what is being have been done since now. Yeah, just to add a comment on, on, on uh, 
Kelly's response. Uh, the, in April 2015, last month, there was a comment on, in Nature speaking about the necessity of uh, neuroscientists to take uh, their data out of their uh, desks. <laughs> And um, for those who work with uh, experimental data here, it's, uh, it's still a reality. I mean, we don't sh uh, have means to share data properly until nowadays. So this is really uh, crucial. And, uh, just an another, this is now is a comment, is a, 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 rather a, su a suggestion uh, that you uh, extend your, your effort to include uh, not only experimental data, but also m model data. Perhaps Julien can talk about, but in in in, in the area of uh, computational neuroscience or theoretical neurobiology, uh, there's a huge effort of modelers to uh, create standards, uh, both in the languages used to represent neuro, single neurons and neural networks, and also ways of simulate them. So there are repositories. Julien has presented some of them yesterday. They are repositories of neuromorphologies, but also neural models and so on. And since this is a neuromathematical project. I think it should include also your models in the database. The actual repository, so the actual repository has, um, if I really understood correctly, they have an effort towards uh, morphological details. Not only morphological, well, it, it includes all aspects that... that but for instance, a model like, uh, like uh, the model Kaina presented, the so-called galvez Lacherbach model, I also look at, is this model, can we put something like this in the repository? I don't think so. Not in that repository, not in, not in yes. neuromorph.org. Yes, so, so it's a problem other, for... There uh, neural models DB, there's a, there are other the databases so it, of models, but we can create our database. Yeah. No, okay. Okay, but okay. we are a few people here. Well, that's never matter. More Fabio Con, more... Uh, so we cannot do everything at the same time. Uh, so I guess if, if it is a good idea, but we should try to start putting all new models in the available data set to see if you can do it. If we can't, so then we, can, we must do something. No, yeah, that is, perhaps you can explain better than me, but uh, there's this neural models, DB, neural models database, neural model DB, uh, which is, I believe, housing in EA or in, in, in the United States. There you can put any model that you want. And they, you have only to refer to a paper which has been published, and then you can put your model using the, I mean, the language, in yeah, in a standard way, way in a standard way. So you and you refer to the paper. So your paper has been published, so you can put it there. So refer Galvez, Lochebach, or any other model that you want, and then it can be used by other researchers or tested by other researchers. I just. I just want to make a brief comment on the statistical methodology and the mathematical methodology that we could also, it's just an idea that we can discuss tomorrow in the open session, that we could probably also create either a package or manuals that people could use our computational code uh, to make it available to the community and everyone who is interested to check and to run some simulations to, I think it's, it's also can be a good idea then to create that. We are, we are writing a version to, to R, mm -hmm. of the package. To select, um, yeah, that would be a good project for the future, maybe for the next year, and to make it available. Okay. At this, uh, we are already considering this. Uh, at this first stage, we are um, including the database, the raw data, the data before the, the, anal the, the analysis. And after that, we will include the derived data and all the, the analysis processes used to, to generate this data. And for this, we... Uh, this is uh, our ambition is to have the portal Neuromat that will work uh, as a science gateway, providing ser analysis services to uh, the community. And uh, we, we imagine that a user 
will be able to create an analysis workflow and use uh, our computational resource to execute this data analysis. Uh, we will use our data, our open data, <laughs> to make his own analysis and things like this. Uh, but uh, this will take some time. <laughs> Just to read, this is the page of ModulDB. So ModulDB provides an accessible location for storing and efficiently retrieving computational neuroscience models. ModulDB is tightly coupled with NeuronDB, which is another database of neural models. Models can be coded in any language for any environment. So any model can be put in there, even abstract models. Model code can be viewed before downloading, and browsers can be set to auto-launch the model. So you can actually this test your model. Be a good task for the team, Juan yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Kalina. Yeah. You could try and load, say, our, <laughs> say, it would be nice to have the Galvez Loscherbach model there. No, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, you can, you can use the site, yeah, or we can establish a link between this site and our, and our database. So, yeah, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, we can add to the effort, to the global effort. Okay, so, we, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's have this 10 minute short break and then we resume. So uh, while you're sitting, uh, two announcements, two short announcements before we start the second part of this morning uh, oral presentations. The first announcement is that we have here a, a presence list. We need to know how many people are coming, have, have come to this uh, workshop. So if you, I'd like to ask you to please write down your name and RG, CPF, and email in this list here, please. Everybody, okay? So have a control of uh, how many people are attending. Second announcement is that uh, uh, we have scheduled uh, a tutorial today after the orals. After the coffee break, actually. Uh, but uh, the, the tutorial is going to be given by Professor Galvis, and he likes to use the blackboard and long ones because he likes to write a lot. So uh, we are moving the, this tutorial from this room to the, how to say, the major room of uh, Neuromat or Numex building across the road just in front of us. So, uh, and the coffee break will be held there as well. So after the last oral, morning, oral uh, presentation of this morning, which is number 12, second or not, uh, the, f the one after this, we move to New Max building, I believe everybody knows, and we'll resume there with the coffee break and the presentation and the tutorial by Galvis, okay? Okay, and then after that we return to this place and have the afternoon session. So without further ado, let's uh, go and carry on with our oral presentation. Uh, so, good morning, all. Uh, this invitation from Neuromath is much appreciated. And here's the title of my talk. Uh, Hippocampal prefrontal plasticity seems to reverberate in a thalamic prefrontal loop. What else neuromathematics could tell us? This is a work in progress, which is part of my current postdoc fellowship. Uh, and at Ribeirão Preto, uh, my, my, my supervisor is João, João Leite, right? So first, I'm go going to start this uh, t talking about uh, talking about the structure, the substrate, uh, which is a specific, a partic particular neural circuit, uh, because you know physiologists like to uh, delimit some circuits. Not 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 just <laughs> it's a necessity to delimit circuits in order to make you know research possible at all. Then his hypothetical function from the phenomenological, physiological perspective. Lastly, it's mathematical exploration and maybe extrapolation. Uh, I will illustrate these ideas uh, by, through, uh, by showing a, a hydroelectrical dam, right? So here we have uh, water potential, and here we have a, a turbine generating a, a electrical power. Uh, this is how I imagine these. Uh, currently, we as physiologists are able to generate a lot of potential, but not too much electricity. Uh, 
maybe it's, now it's time for a lab, like using some additional analytical approaches to, you know, uh, get these hydroelectrical power running more in a more efficient way. I think this is the, the point here, right? Data sharing, collaboration, etc. Uh, maybe you, uh, you guys, uh, will figure what we, 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 what could be possible to do with data that I could just donate after doing physiological analysis. And also my my friends at uh, Ribeirão Preto. Uh, so I, I'm going to, just just to show you some, some hypothesis deriving from previous work from our laboratory. Uh, basically, uh, we are interested in triangular communications between the hippocampus, thalamus, and, and neocortex. As this figure is illustrating, there there is anatomically there are anatomically known topographical uh, connections between uh, between these uh, great areas because so you have some thalamic nuclei, nuclei that are specific relate, specifically related to specific particular uh, neocortical areas which in turn are particularly related to specific parts of the hippocampus and and so on. So in this sense, by making a, a delimitation, physiological delimitation, here's our particular interest. A, a specific part of the hippocampus, say one subiculum area, a specific part of the thalamus, which is not, as ex, not necessarily sensorial, is more like cognitive and limbic than sensorial and motor, and the prefrontal cortex, which uh, I think everybody, everyone, everyone knows about its importance in terms of cognition and uh, long-term or short-term memory. The anatomical record shows us that uh, there's, there's a new directional con connection between this region and some deep layers of the prefrontal cortex, which in turn communicate bidirectionally with this particular part of the thalamus, right? So some, here's some uh, hypotheses that are deriving from our previous work, uh, I will, will illustrate by, by uh, these uh, slow oscillations at the background, which could be either because of slow wave, slow wave sleep or deep anesthesia. Uh, doing a, a, a physiological context like this, uh, our idea is that it, it, it is possible to induce synaptic plasticity in the prefrontal cortex by doing some electrical stimulation inside the brain more specifically inside this part of the hippocampus. In contrast, during a rapid oscillation background, you have a stronger, uh, uh, the, the, this uh, pathway here is more prone, it's to, to, more prone to, to, to undergo synaptic plasticity uh, in a background of REM sleep or conscious state. And also you have a, a, a higher, how to say, uh, this loop here is more prone to, uh, tra uh, to convert this synaptic plasticity into a, a, a excitatory reverberation. These are hypotheses deriving from actual biological data from previous work, right? So these hypotheses inspired the, this, this uh, question about now. Let, let's do something different now. Uh, in the past, we were used to induce synaptic plasticity either from... Uh, by electrical stimulation of the th of the hippocampus or thalamus, and recording the results of these electrically induced synaptic plasticity in the prefrontal cortex. My current work is to induce hippocampally induce synaptic plasticity, and then record from both the prefrontal cortex and in the thalamus in the same, the very same animals. Other difference is that in the past we were uh, used to record just field electrophysiology, like LFP oscillations and so on. Now we are also able to, besides field electrophysiology, field responses like those event-related responses, uh, we are also we are also able to record single unit activity, right? So we have uh, the, the, the the two layers of electrophysiological data, like we which increased a lot our, our experimental and data yield, right? So uh, here here is the the actual uh, illustration of the experiment. Here's just uh, the, the rat skull uh, seen from, from above, uh, just showing the, the, the sites, implantation sites, recording, uh, thalamic recording, cortical recording, and hippocampus stimulation. Here's just some uh, histology to show uh, electrode positioning. Uh, I, I, I could show you, uh, if you are interested, uh, uh, the actual pictures of the electrodes, which are made of eight channels, 
it could be eight channels or 16 channels uh, wires into the brain, right, to record LF, uh, oscillations and single units. And here's the design. 30-minute uh, rec recording, cortical and thalamic recording, then a high frequency stimulation for induction, high frequency stimulation within the hippocampus for induction of synaptic plasticity, then an additional two-hour recording. Another detail is that throughout the timeline, except for the, the, the HFS period, I delivered parapulses uh, every 10 seconds, parapulses with an 80 millisecond separation to prove the communication, uh, the, uh, to prove the, the communication within this triangular circuit. This is like a, a, this is like a radio paradigm in, in our laboratory. Many other experiments use similar timelines. So here are some descriptive statistics. Some results. I'm not going to show all the results, right? Just uh, the part of the results that I'm, uh, in my opinion, are more pertinent to to the to the workshop. So here's uh, uh, here's just uh, here's uh, this data here is just showing the activity of one one single neuron from the prefrontal cortex. So here you have a raster plot, right? And these the x-axis of this raster plot is a time window, 1.4 second time window around around periposes. No, no, no. Uh, the, this is the x-axis of the period event time around the periposes that I showed in the, in the previous slide, right? So this is just one neuron. And if you can imagine the timeline, the, the timeline that I just showed, that I just shown, is now in the y-axis. So, spike train. yeah, spike train. Yeah, but the raster plot, period event raster plot, not the, not, uh, this is just one neuron. So you have the recording length, baseline, then age of the uh, induction of synaptic plasticity, and then the additional two hour recording. So I'm just considering the neuroactivity around these uh, period pulses, 1.4 uh, second, right? So I'm, I'm d disregarding the rest of the, the, the activity. So this represents, this is a way to represent the period event activity of these neurons around the period pulses that are delivered back in the hippocampus, right? Showing that uh, these neurons, after each, uh, after these parables, th there is some response by these neurons, which is kind of an inhibition followed by, by an, uh, an increase of activity, right? Especially, especially after the induction of synaptic plasticity. This image is just, just the, the, the same, uh, just another, another way to, to show the same thing. But instead of showing uh, individual spikes, I'm just showing the image, image uh, scale. Call cool. okay. Uh, the, well, uh, the raster plot is uh, you probably understood your raster plot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. But th this is another way. Another all. It's. Yeah. So what is time? Time. This is time around parables, and this is the time. This is also also time, but the, the overall time of the recording session, right? This is a, an, this is another paradigm. It's, it's Yeah. Spike. Each dot is a spike. My friend, I need a formula now. So don't don't keep repeating the same thing. Give me a formula. So what is the absence, the x, the x and y of each dot? X x axis, 1.4 second time window. The Blue triangles are pulses that were delivered in the that are delivered in the hippocampus, right? So, I given that I'm delivering delivering these pulses every 10 seconds, that means that uh, 8.6 seconds are just disregarded from this analysis. This is a pure event analysis. This is a paradigm. It's just another type of of yes. This is just another way of uh, generating resters okay and uh, each this is like a, a, a stacking I just the uh, these time segments are just stack it so I, it's just I, I'm, I'm, t I'm taking the the whole spike train dividing dividing it into the into these segments it and putting them not sequentially but under beneath it, each other 
And this is just the, the image, like dividing this stuff into, into, I don't know, 10 millisecond beans, and I don't remember, five or 10 millisecond beans, and generating, generating some, col some beautiful colors, I don't know. And finally, another way to, to show the activity of this prefrontal neuron is the traditional, uh, uh, how to say, histograms. Just smooth it to, for some aesthetics. And uh, black, cur black curve is representing the, the average of the first 30 minutes, which is the baseline before this, the induction of synaptic plasticity. Blue curve is representing the first half an hour after induction of synaptic plasticity. And the, the orange curve is representing the last half an hour of the recording session before the animal is killed. Okay? And this is just to illustrate the spike waveform and ISI histogram. Interesting thing here is that I'm, I will show another representative unit from the medial dorsal thalamus, showing that uh, these units, this uh, thalamic unit neuron is like a faster responder, right? You have a, uh, an excitation after uh, parapulse, especially after uh, when synaptic plasticity is induced, and then like uh, uh, silencing of these neuron, and then he go, the, the, it goes back to normal. And once again, these curves are clearly representing that after HFS, later induction of synaptic plasticity, you have a phasic response of this thalamic, this thalamic neuron. Yeah. Yes. From from the hippocampus, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, the synaptic plasticity is a, a, another paradigm. Well, Hab gave the idea of the cells that fight together, wire together, and then uh, uh, two decades later, uh, some guys uh, from from UK did the experiment that the experiment that actually uh, confirmed Hab's ideas, like which is very similar. We, we are using the same paradigm. Right? You can record, uh, you can probe the, the synaptic plasticity by delivering pulses in one region and recording in another region, which is receiving those accents. And you can deliver every 30 seconds or one minute, whatever. And then you can stop the, the, the recording and simulation, induce synaptic plasticity by delivering a train of pulses it's like just like, just like that. Be before synaptic plasticity, you, you were uh, delivering pulses like that, truck, then 10 seconds or truck, electrical pulses. Then you stop these after 30 minutes and then deliver a trains of pulses, trrr, 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 like mimicking endogenous uh, patterns of of activity. After these manipulations, it just resumed the low frequency stimulation. Trrr to see if field responses are increased or decreased because of synaptic plasticity inducing. This is what we, we did in our lab. This is a paradigm well known around the world, okay, and also in, in our laboratory. Novelty here is that we are being able to record both the field responses, which are equivalent to event-related responses, and single units, right? Uh, I'm sorry? The you mean in this unit? Ah, oh, the, these, these here? Yeah, it's interesting because... Uh, yeah, no, not visible. Well, in this unit, per, in this particular unit, for example, not, not just this unit, right? I have some additional three or four thalamic units that after, uh, uh, how to say, in the, from this time point on, if you, if you generate a, rate hist a, a regular rate histogram, like, like ju just like uh, Antonio Galvez said, like uh, uh, overall histogram disregarding the, the, the activity around the periposis, you get an increase, which is spontaneous increase, not, not pulse, it's uh, not pulse driven, like it's, in my opinion, I, 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 I'm still discussing this, but it seems that this is a late-onset effect of high-frequency stimulation. This, uh, 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 this, uh, I, I have the, the data I could show you, but I'm not showing here, but I will show you some graphs to uh, showing that 
actually, this is not, they're not only a thalamic unit, thalamic neuron that behave like that. I have some additional f three or four that behave just, just like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, sorry, this is a z-score. z-score against the baseline mean. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, only two neurons? No, no, I have more neurons. I have 20 neurons in the, actually, I have 20 neurons in the prefrontal cortex, and this time I'm representing the neurons by a different way. Imagine that this is a, the black curve, baseline curve, this is the blue curve, and this is a, the, the orange curve, right? Each row of these images are individual neurons. And the stacking order of all these neurons are based on the, this period here from uh, x-axis R line, okay? This period here from 200 milliseconds to 800 milliseconds, I got the average of this period, and then just I just ordered, did, did I stack the stacking order of uh, from top to bottom, like from excited to inhibited. And the order shown here is exactly this, the same shown here and here, which means that uh, the unit you are seeing in this row is exactly the same in this row and this row. This is another paradigm. Uh, it, many people use analysis like that, pure event analysis. Once again, here are the parapulses. And it, it's interesting to see that some neurons respond to parapulses in a phas phasic manner. But after HFS, after HFS, some, some units that were like silent in this long latency period be, became uh, more excitable because of the parapulses, and this effect was vanished like two, one or two hours ago uh, after, after that. The interesting, also interesting thing is about the 16 neurons from the thalamus. You have also some phasic responses, but you, you don't have this differentiation between phasic Phasic responders and low and low long latency responders. You you get some re neurons that respond both both phasically and like at, at the long latency, right? Some differentiation between between units. Uh, these graphs are just the mean plus minus standard error to compare the the midline thalamus showing the these actual. Uh, phasic responses were stronger in the medial dorsal thalamus, and in the prefrontal cortex, these uh, long latency responses were actually stronger than the medial dorsal thalamus, just the opposite, right? These graphs are just the same that, uh, as these ones, but this time comparing each brain site, the brain sites with themselves. And lastly, this is the, the graph I, I like most because these bars are the average of these long latency period that I just talked about. To, to, uh, uh, I was talk, talking to you guys. Uh, it was it's, uh, indeed uh, you have after HFS you have uh, a significantly higher excitation because of parapulses in the prefrontal cortex. So uh, differentiation between the, the, these two. So let's let's try to do some draw, draw some conclusions. MD thalamic neurons did respond to hippocampal pulses. Phasic excitation, then transient inhibition. And this seems to be HFS favored. P, prefrontal cortical responses were subtler and slower inhibition than excitation. And this seems to be HFS dependent. Lastly, I'm going to show you uh, the, same, the same rationale. The same rationale. The x axis is per event, and the y axis here is showing the, the recording length. But this time I'm zooming in to show uh, in details. Uh, 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 a tiny uh, uh, temporal window of 108, 180 milliseconds. So this time, this time you, you show that the, the, the pair pulses like in a, in a zoomed way. Another difference is this time I'm not showing neurons. I'm, I'm showing field responses, like event-related responses to the, those pair pulses. And this image here is just representing each row is a single one of these, these guys. Each row is a single voltage trace. They are just stacked, okay, to show you to show uh, the pair pulses before and after synaptic plasticity induction, right? Indicated by the the arrow here. Yeah, so uh, it's clear to see that you have a W-like shape of the res these response in the prefrontal cortex, but not in the medial dorsal thalamus. You have a single uh, V-like response in the medial dorsal thalamus, and uh, uh, the, these, these, gener sorry, these, these generates some 
this uh, data, along with the single unit data, generates uh, uh, the, the, this hypothesis. Maybe, actually, uh, there is an ad additional connection between these two guys here, which is not so well uh, uh, described in the anatomical literature. Some few papers just described these. And when, when, I, when I went to, to, to SSFN, some, some guys criticized me, saying that I, I was doing something wrong because this, this actually is, is, is wrong, this, this is not existing. I don't know. I, I, still, I still have to do some, some controls. Like, for example, I, I'd like to do to, to in, a, in, a, in, a, in a subsequent experiment to, to maybe block this node here to see if the second leg of the prefrontal response is also blocked. These would demonstrate that uh, the prefrontal cortex is both re receiving hippocampal inputs and hippocampal thalamic inputs. And these hippocampal thalamic inputs are, is, 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 this is a design that it's now f is kind of now for other uh, thalamic systems that are more sensorial and motor. And they usually uh, uh, call these systems as efferent copies. What efferent copies are, are just like that. Uh, you have a, a, a movement. You, the, the animal is, is going to prefer, um, perform a movement like a saccade, right? And then uh, besides the, 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 move, the actual motor control, you have a copy of the motor control, indirect copy of the motor control, to make the brain aware that this movement is going to happen. And some, some people believe that schizophrenia would, would be related to a, a deficit in that self-awareness of movements. Hey, that movement, that, like saying, that the same is uh, the brain saying, hey, the movement you, you are about to, to perform is yours, not from, other outside, from an outside agency. It's yours. So if you have a defect, you, some, uh, some people believe that some symptoms of schizophrenia, like uh, believing that uh, it, your own actions are not actually yours, it's, uh, it, it's because of deficit in this system. But actually, uh, this, this system is sensory motor. Maybe, I, I, didn't, I didn't find the literature yet, a similar system for a cognitive uh, process. So maybe this, this could be something, this could lead to, to, to this pathway. And are these efferent copies modulated by, the, by the, the sleep wake cycle? Do they have something to do with working memory or the spread of epileptic seizures? Because this uh, thalamic nucleus is, is known for for, for the spread of epileptic seizures. So maybe it could be a connection between epilepsy and deficits in working memory, etc. So just to, to finalize, I, uh, the, maybe the similar patterns could be found in other hippocampal neocortical thalamic triangles. And maybe this could be, uh, you know, uh, taken to a, a broader uh, uh, point of view through neuromathematics because it, it feels for me that uh, physiology, at least in our laboratory, we are, we are touching our limits. And only collabor collaborations could uh, take these data to a, a higher, to a higher levels of analysis and to, to help uh, eventually to fill some, some gaps in the, these puzzles. We don't have time for questions, but uh, on behalf of the discussion, I mean, anyone has a very short one, or, or perhaps you can just postpone it to tomorrow or to the coffee break. Yes, uh, maybe the, the question would be: What do, do you think are the contributions that mathematics could yeah. could do? Yeah, I, I was thinking about that uh, during the uh, previous presentations. Uh, from, uh, in some rats, uh, you, 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 put, you, you do so the, the implant, like a channel implant in the prefrontal cortex and in the medial dorsal thalamus. In some rats, you get no neurons, zero neurons. But in some other rats, you get, you get five neurons or in the prefrontal cortex, another five neurons there in the medial dorsal thalamus. So given that you are st stimulating on a third region, it's possible, maybe it's possible to get at least a pair of units in the prefrontal cortex and medial dorsal thalamus that are functionally connected. And this demonstration, we are still lacking. We have this type of demonstration, like just getting some post hoc uh, significant results and describing the thing. But uh, we are still lacking uh, an additional approach. Uh, we, uh, for example, a little bit more than, for example, cross-correlation, right? To find eventually, 
if uh, the, all those two regions, because we are uh, we're just coping with spike trains, right? And some rats, just some rats are, are, are very hard to say. The neuron yield of some rats is very high in such a way that we have, uh, um, how to say, uh, a good amount of spike trains to be analyzed, not just in terms of pure event rasters or, you know. Uh, and the, these spike trains are just there. Uh, we are just generating them, and after doing physiological analysis, they just these data just sit, sit there in the, the computers without any additional analysis. We are trying to study, but we also have blood on our hands, so we have time. We have to take our time to do surgery, To you know about that. So it's not not, not always possible for, for biologists like me. I, I, I'm, I'm, t I'm, I'm trying to, to take the, 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 the challenge to study things and not my, my formation, but I think it, uh, a more efficient way would be to... Uh, converse uh, to, to chat with uh, people from the uh, exact science to get some ideas to, for new for these new analysis mm -hmm. Ray, you yeah. mean that when you're stimulating the hippocampus and you're recording thalamus and prefrontal cortex mm. you get an evidence that these regions are I mean you're attacking at one neuron here and being able to to record that at least for a group of neurons that have been yeah. uh, activated there, right? So your idea would be how to model these relationships, this triangle yeah. of connections that you are uh, for, for example, putting forward with your yeah. very detailed methodology. For example, given the anatomical record, you can eventually, I, I was imagining uh, the same thing, but simulating, for example. Because you can like reproduce the position of the inhibitory neurons in the prefrontal cortex and the position of the axon terminals that are terminating both in pyramidal neurons in the prefrontal cortex and inhibitory neurons in the prefrontal cortex, which in turn terminate in those pyramidal neurons back. And also the design of the pyramidal cells coming from the hippocampus. Maybe by reproducing these within the computer and trying to, to get the computer to generate similar data what could be a good strategy to uh, for a simulation strategy. Yeah. So thank you. And so let's move on to the last speaker of this uh, morning session, who is going to be um, Lidiani Souza from UFRG, Rio de Janeiro, functional connectivity of patients with brachial plexus injury, a resting state from my study. Eu já conheço mais coisas de diferentes áreas, que a maior parte dos biólogos conhecem. Porque o quem faz uma coisa não trabalha com F, com FMRI, nem com EG. Aqui tem gente falando de registros sanitários comigo, de FMRI comigo. Eu não posso fazer o que eu estou fazendo já. Eu passo um tempo infinito lendo biólogos. Está na hora dos biólogos ler um pouquinho. Ah. Eu Exato, mas é isso. Todo mundo quer, né? Não, não, mas é isso que tem. Mas é isso eu estou sendo esse matemático, mas é. É, mas eu estou lendo. So good morning. My name is Lidiane. I'm a student of Instituto de Biofísica Carlos Chagas Filho of Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. Claudia Vargas is my supervisor. And I will present the study entitled Functional Connective of Patients with Brachial Plexus Injury, a Resting State of MRI Study. So, what is brachial plexus? <laughs> uh, 
you not uh, is new for us. The brachial plexus is a neural network responsible for motor, sensory, and autonomic innovation of the upper limb. It's composed for. It's composed for five nerve roots, four cervical roots, and the first thorax root. And the C5 and C6 form the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, responsible for movements of the shoulder and elbow flexion. The C7 form the middle trunk of the brachial plexus, responsible for el elbow extension and movements of the wrist, thumb, and fingers extrinsic. And C8 and T1 form the lower, tr lower trunk of the brachial plexus, responsible for motricity and gripping for hand. So the brachial plexus injury is not, it's not so uncommon. Approximately 10 to 20% of peripheral nervous system injuries involve the brachial plexus. And the patient's profile is worrying because affected young subjects aged less than 30 years old involving auto or motorcycle accidents. So the type of this lesion can be complete that affects all trunks or all, or all roots of the brachial plexus are incomplete. So here is a photo of the patient of the institute and we can observe the, the change, né? the tropism of his left upper limb, the atro atrophism of these muscles. So for a mortal recovery, the therapeutic approaches are performed. The, the mains are the reconstruction of brachial plexus and the physiotherapy. So it, is, it has been described that after the peripheral lesion uh, occurred the brain reorganization, phenomenal as the plasticity. Here is a representation of the cortex of this health subject. Uh, the highlight here is correspond to primary sensory cortex behind the primary moral cortex. And in these two areas was described the presence of the somatotopic maps of the body. And after the peripheral lesion, in this case, the hand amputation occurred the invasion of these, these representations toward the region be, before devoted to, to the hand area. So the, the invasion of the face representation and the upper limb representation and trunk toward the, the, the area before devoted to hand. Uh, similar is found for sensor and motor cortex. Some studies showed uh, brain organization in patients with brachial plexus injury. So this, is, this injury is less drastic than amputation because the member is still present. Uh, and our, our studies investigated this issue with the, using the test paradigm as the elbow flexion. So Liu and co-workers uh, showed change of intermisphere functional connective between the primary motor cortex in patients with brachial plexus injury in resting state. So the resting state is the paradigm without task where the subject is instructed to remain in resting no sleep and not thinking of anything in specific. And this analysis, the resting state analysis, has some advantages in relation to task drive analysis. For this group, the patients with brachial plexus injury do his moral impairment. And this issue was investigated using the fMRI technique that registered the both signal. So, uh, two regions, two 
inter 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 regions were selected uh, the left primary motor cortex and the right primary motor cortex in highlighting in blue and red. And the both signal over time of these two regions was, ana uh, was analyzed, the correlation between these two regions was analyzed in order to observe uh, the correlation between them. And the t-test was performed uh, to investigate the correlation between these two areas. Uh, so uh, was compare the average of the correlation coefficient for these two areas for the control group and the patient group. And, uh, and was observed the lower values for the patient group in, in relation to the control group. This indicated the, the decrease of the, fun, the, of the functional connective between these two areas. So based on this study, we investigated the functional connective changes in primary motor cortex in a group of patients with brachial plexus injury, uh, all patients uh, with avulsion, and submitted it to intercostal musculocutaneous nerve transfer with the fMRI technique in resting state. So this work has been developed thanks to the, the, the partnerships with Brazil and Netherlands and Brazil-Argentina and São Paulo-Rio de Janeiro, Professor Antonio Galvez and Professor Claudia Vargas. And the financial support of these institutions. Uh, here is a name of the, the authors of this study, is a big study. So participating in this study, 90 right-handed patients with right brachial plexus avulsion submitted to intercostal musculocutaneous nerve, nerve transfer. So in this surgical procedure, brains of the intercostal nerve that innervated the trunk region of the body uh, were, were transferred to musculocutaneous nerve that innervated the anterior compartment of the arm responsible for the movement of the elbow flexion. And 11 right-handed control subjects matching in age and sex with the patient's group uh, also participates in this study. So data acquisition was performed in Netherlands by a group of the professor Malesi and the, the scanner, uh, the true Tesla scanner was used for collecting the vote signal and the participants were structured to keep their eyes closed and not to think of anything in specific during the resting state scanning by five minutes. Uh, so uh, the analysis were performed in order to investigate the local interactions between the voxels to understand how interactions decay as function of the distance between them and to compare the correlation behavior between these groups, the control group and the patient with brachial plexus injury group. So each voxel has two associated quantities, the time, the resting state time series and the position. In this study, each voxel uh, has two millimeters of dimension for the X, W and Z coordinates and the degree of the correlation between two voxels was calculated using the experiment correlation. And the distance between the voxels uh, was considered Euclidean distance. For each distance between voxels, we compute the 95% of confidence interval on the population value of the experiment correlation 
and after for each distance between the voxels was compared the correlation between the two groups, patient group and control group, using a man witness test. So, uh, different masks were created inside the primary motor cortex. So, the, respecting the somatotopic uh, map organization. So, the red mask corresponds the lower limb representation. The green mask corresponds the hip and trunk representation. The dark blue mask corresponds the upper limb representation. The orange mask corresponds the, the neck region representation, and the light blue mask corresponds the face representation. Approximately, <laughs> it's not so limited. Uh, we might be limited. Uh, here, uh, these graphs represent the the values of the average of the correlation coefficient. For each, each group, the control group and the patient group, in black is the, the control group and in purple is the patient group. So the, the bars correspond to the 95% of the confidence interval as a functional at the, as distance between the voxels from 0 to 10 distance. Remember that each voxel has 2 millimeters uh, and so the distance uh, equal to correspond to four, four millimeters, uh, the distance between the voxels. So difference between the groups were observed uh, for the red mask that correspond to the lower limb representation, the, the more medial representation. The green mask that correspond the hip and trunk representation, and the dark blue mask that correspond the upper limb representation. But no difference between the, the, these groups were found for orange mask that correspond the neck region, or the light blue mask that correspond the face representation. So this picture uh, here is the the level of the significance uh, for, for the two groups, for the red mask, green mask, and dark blue mask as a function as distance. So difference, difference uh, high levels of distance of difference were found for smaller distance between the voxels and intermediate distance between them. So this study uh, showed brain organization patients with brachial plexus injury with uh, uh, refined, refined measures and suggests that this, this organization reflects the lesion and the, and the, the surgical procedure uh, was performed. And we suggest that's the decay of the correlation between the voxels as functional as distance uh, can be occurred due to the decrease of the, the activity of the horizontal connections. Uh, so. And uh, the second study uh, proposed characterize the functional connective by EEG for investigating the functional connective in other brain regions, not only primary motor cortex, the motor cortex areas, and investigate if there is a correlation between the degree of functional connective and the upper limb functionality. So, uh, patients with brachial plexus above injuries are being recruited in the institute and the control subjects are being matched for sex and age with the group of the brachial plexus injury. So the experimental design, the 100 
28 channel system by electrical geodesk uh, is, is in is in used is being used for collecting the signal and uh, when the subject uh, remain in resting state for three minutes. So we intend to perform the correlation analysis between the ele electrodes uh, distributed over the SCAP subjects. And the, the, stu the study is in developing. It's all. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it was a great explanation, a great presentation. So, have time for questions? Everybody understood very well what to talk. of the Antonio, Claudio, or Michel? No, I think there are lots of questions, of course, because mm. in the work in the data from, mm. from the Netherlands, uh, we, well, we have a, fi a first picture of what probably happened with the system after the injury. And there is a conjecture of, 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 uh, about the meaning of this. So we could try to imagine uh, things like uh, in the new data with the EEG, if you can recover something of the same type. Uh, so I guess there is lots of discussion. Uh, we don't know. We don't. We don't know much about the plasticity effects after injury, and this is a, is a huge challenge. I remember uh, Martin Males had a picture. So after the injury, uh, the region of the brain which was responsible. For, uh, for controlling the intercostal muscles, it starts controlling also the arm, which is not obvious. And then you see, you see, you see the region controlling the arm to return to the original position. I, I'm not doing it in a realistic way. I don't know what are, where are the regions, but uh, you see. And then a question like the following: So what is the what is the pass, the region which uh, uh, uses to return to the original position. And this is a question of large deviation. This is precisely the question like uh, the way you move from a bottom, pot bottom, the bottom of a potential wall to go to the other wall. Uh, but we don't have a, a principle, a variational principle, as we have uh, for the events of Friday, I, I do this for the mathematicians, because uh, uh, people in biology understood. But uh, Pablo, uh, uh, Pablo, my friend, uh, he is asking himself, but what the hell is Antonio doing with this? Uh, of course, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this because I believe there is an interesting question. And the interesting question is to describe the way uh, the region of the brain which now controls two things, arm and intercostal muscles, divide again and the, the control of the, of the arm returns, hopefully, to the old. We don't know how to describe this. We are able to, to find the way. Uh, how do we do it? Because Claudia gets there with a, a transcranial magnetic stimulation and she is able to see uh, when she puts a, a pulse here, where, where in, the, in the body the reaction arrives. So she can exactly make a map. But now we need to understand. And probably the answer is the following. There is some kind of a function now like um, free energy. But it's not free energy. But like free energy, something we make a, making a balance between efficiency and cost which must be maximized. And the way you move max, maximizes, we don't know. So I, I guess uh, in plasticity there are a lot of interesting mathematical questions. And uh, this is important not because the mathematical questions are interesting, but also 
because uh, people working in, in therapy, like Juliana, they, they only know how to control if the procedure or the surgery was well succeeded, just by looking at the effects of the motions. But uh, if uh, Claudia gives them a map of uh, obtained by TMS, they are not able to interpret it and to say, look, this is a good signal. We just don't understand. So I, I guess there is an entire interface between um, therapy, surgery, and statistical analysis, which has to be developed. I remember when we started the Neuromath project, um, I was discussing with um, Daniel Takahashi, and then uh, Livio Triolo sent me a paper by a Chinese team working with patients after a stroke. And then they describe the way the, the regions of the brain interact after the stroke, immediately after the stroke, or 10 days after the stroke, one month, three months, using fMRI data. You have the same with EEG, given by, the, the, done by Leonardo Cohen, member of the team. So, and then they describe that immediately after the stroke, the graph was um, a graph of the type uh, small world. And then 10 days later, it was no more a small world. It was something else, more close to our Erdos-Henny graph. And then during the year after the stroke, uh, the, 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 the patient uh, recovered. And then the graph changes qualities. What is the mathematical explanation of this? We don't know how to explain uh, the way a system uh, in, uh, of interactions evolve from one graph to another one. We don't, we don't know. We, we, there is nothing in the mathematical literature explaining how graphs evolve. Of course, it's easy to say, well, let's do a Markov evolution. It's not Markov. So I think there is lots of questions, Pablo, in plasticity, lots that need to be formulated and not probably difficult questions because nobody asks them. Because neuro, neurobiologists uh, ignore absolutely everything on mathematics, and mathematicians are too lazy to learn biological questions. And, uh, and, and you keep uh, doing the magical words like freestone, speaking about free energy, when there is no free energy in the sense of Boltzmann for a system which is not in equilibrium. So uh, we have a situation which is very favorable for the in uh, for the co collab collaborative effects between mathematicians and neurobiologists, because they have the phenomena and they don't have the tools. So, if you are able to formulate uh, concrete questions, we have uh, lots of things to do. So, I think there are lots of questions to ask about uh, the second experiment and the first one. Well, tomorrow we could discuss. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. As I have announced before, we are moving now to the Numex building to have coffee break and then the tutorial by Antonio Galvez. And we will probably enter the lunch time doing that because it's already 11.20.